Welcome back to Wild World. As we are reaching the end of the series, we have decided to include as much wildlife as possible with two final bumper episodes. This week we are focusing on invertebrates and reptiles on some of the smaller stuff. And to begin with, we're heading over to Gwythian Towns, an incredibly important sand dune system on Cornwall's north coast, where filmmaker Mia Rumble is working out how she can invite some of the life on the dunes into her garden. I grew up next to the Towans, which is a three mile stretch of sand dunes and it's a really important habitat for a lot of wildlife. Right now, circumstances are quite hard for us and a lot of us may be struggling, but the good side is that in certain habitats like the sand dunes, where there's a lot of holiday makers and tourism brings in a lot of people and that creates a lot of footfall on the dunes. We're not getting that this year, and as it's springtime, things like skylarks, ground-nesting birds, they're really benefiting from not being disturbed quite as often. Some of the amazing animals that are up on the dunes are quite a few reptiles. This year, we've decided to try and get them into the garden a bit more. A really easy way to encourage reptiles into your garden is to use something that's really going to draw in heat. You'll find them in your compost bins, you'll find them in old, dry, warm, woody places. I've just used old doormats. I had the mats up for a while and we know that they're slow worms. There's usually always a slow worm under there if it's been a nice warm day. They're generally just chilling underneath the mats. Okay, so we're gonna have a little look under here. See what we can find. Oh, we've got a little slow worm. So these guys are a legless lizard and they can actually shed their tails, which makes them different to a snake. They also can blink their tiny little eyes. They've got little tiny eyelids and snakes don't have those. It's really exciting opening up the map to see what you might find that day. It's so easy to do and especially if you're feeling unmotivated, it's a really easy way to connect with nature. Diving beneath the surface, we now meet Ian Hughes, who is working to conserve a surprising species whose disappearance across much of Europe and the UK has potentially resulted in some even bigger losses. The glutinous snail is one of the most endangered of all animals in Europe. It's extinct, or thought to be extinct, in at least three countries and is on the brink of extinction in all the others, pretty much where it's known. And with its unique bubble-like shell, uh, I think it's pretty special. About five years ago I was asked if I would be willing to set up a, a captive population of these snails because they are so, um, so ridiculously threatened. Now in order to understand what, what that snail needs to survive I felt that I had to um, get into its world and, uh, and explore its, uh, its life cycle as intimately as possible. In order to feed them I keep these uh, cups in water where algae builds up on them and the snails can feed on the algae. But also, they use the cups and the walls of the pond to lay their beautiful eggs. That's probably got about 12 eggs in it and um, each one is iridescent, it has some iridescent skin on it. They're beautiful little things and they take about 30 days to hatch. This is the shell of the gluten snail and uh, it is so delicate that I can't actually pick it up because they, they need very little nutrition to build the shell, it allows them to live in places where other snails can't because they need more nutrients. Um, but also it's very weak to um, pesticides, fertilizers and other agricultural chemicals. What would it mean if they were pushed to extinction? We may possibly not notice the difference, but we, we have noticed things like the, the corncrake, uh, the, the crane, the, uh, the stork, uh, many species disappearing from Britain, which may have relied to some extent on small animals like the glutinous snail. Five years ago we knew virtually nothing about it, we didn't know why it had declined to this single point. Uh, but now we do. Uh, we know uh, how it breeds, we know that it likes warmth, we know why it lays its eggs. So that in itself, knowledge is hope. Although many of our natural water sources might be too polluted to support populations of the glutinous snail, Ian's research has shown that our ponds and our gardens could potentially offer a refuge for future populations. And now we meet Ben Porter, who is set up and ready to trap a nighttime visitor to our gardens. 
This morning I'm going to be walking you through this intriguing contraption in front of me here. This is a moth trap and it provides a fantastic portal into the world of these awesome creatures. I'm talking about those 2,500 species that we can encounter in the British Isles. So, a moth trap, what does it consist of? So, essentially, it's just a light, which is on this trap, a little tubular bulb here, set on top of a box, which on the top of it has a funnel where the moths come through, settle into the box, and the light is attached to a power source. In my case, it's a 12 volt battery, but it can also be mains electricity. So essentially, during the night, the light is on, the moths fly towards the light, go into the moth trap, and in the morning, we'll come to the trap and examine what we have caught. You can get some absolutely fantastic species attracted to these moth traps. I've had about 1,500 individual moths in one of these small little traps. It's incredible. Now, whilst I do have a moth trap like this myself, you don't have to buy one. Even just a white bed sheet hung up outside with a light nearby illuminating it at night can be a really good substitute for a moth trap. Now, I've been taking note of a lot of these different sightings that we've been having here, both in the moth trap and in the garden itself. And I'll be sending these in to contribute to the national database, which is a vital resource to keep track of how our insect populations are changing over time. It's really important and it's great fun as well. So get out there and get stuck into it. And now time for our weekly bird song lesson with the lovely Lucy. Hello everyone and welcome back to another bird song of the week. This week's songster is an iconic one. It is so good at singing, it actually has the word song in its name. It is the song thrush and this bird is one of the first to start singing each spring. They're very, very iconic and they often sing from an obvious perch, so you can see them at the top of a tree, belting the little hearts out. Now the song of the song thrush is very, very distinct and they almost sound like a mix of all different types of birds blended together. The thing to listen out for when they're singing is the phrases that they pick. The song thrush will pick a phrase and it'll dwell on it so it will repeat it three, four times. It then decides it's bored of it and moves on to the next. So listen to it picking out one phrase, saying it again and again and again, pausing and then moving on to the next, again and again and again. A really distinct one and hopefully a nice and easy one for you to pick up. Now we join a brilliant young naturalist, 14-year-old Indy, who is capturing a colourful visitor to a small body of water on his family farm. Since lockdown started, it's been particularly dry for many parts of the UK. Therefore, I'm making sure the birds in my area have a plentiful water supply to drink and bathe in. Now for the last few years I've been keeping the small pool next to my house topped up all year round and because of its unique location being bordered by farmland it is made available to more than just your regular garden birds. I've seen chaffinches, goldfinches, even swallows skimming over the surface taking a sip but the star of the show has been the gorgeous yellow wagtail. So I'm in the hide right now and the pool is actually only around 4 metres in front of me here and I've closed off all the entrances to the hide so it's only my camera sticking out to watch the pool to make sure if the birds do come down, I don't disturb them. That's splash. Genuinely, the yellow wagtails just dropped down now. That's amazing. Literally, as I was speaking to you just then, I heard that little splash outside, and the yellow wagtail was actually bathing in the pool just there while I was talking to you absolutely amazing and now you can just really see what I meant by those vibrant colours just those yellows absolutely fantastic so so great to capture yellow wagtails have a striking yellow plumage they are typically a farmland bird and they have come all the way from Africa to visit my pool now I hope you've all enjoyed catching a glimpse of the lovely yellow wagtail and always remember keep them water bowls topped up for all your garden visitors For our final introduction, we meet Gemma Waring, who is on the hunt for another well-known UK reptile. 
I'm here today in the Bisso Valley Trail, which I'm incredibly lucky to have literally right on my doorstep. And I've been making the most of my daily exercise during lockdown by exploring the area and discovering the wildlife. Today I'm going to be showing you one of my favourite little critters that I have found to be thriving here, the common lizard. Now the common lizard is a fascinating little reptile. As its name suggests, it is the most widespread of our lizards in the UK. South facing verges and embankments are a good place to start looking for these little lizards, as well as piles of logs, stone walls and the edge of woodland or scrub patches. Like other reptiles, common lizards are ectothermic, which means that they can't generate their own body heat and so have to warm themselves up by basking in the sun. Look out for potential basking shots such as these patches of moss, which is a perfect heat absorbing surface for lizards. This time of year, the lizards have recently emerged from their hibernation sites and are looking to mate, so this is a really good time of the year to try and spot them. The unusual thing about common lizards is that the females incubate the eggs inside themselves and actually give birth to live young, which is absolutely fascinating for a reptile species. These tiny reptiles really are amazing creatures, so be sure to keep your eyes peeled for them next time you're out on your daily exercise. It's been a jam-packed episode with some of our smaller and some of our lesser known species, but it just goes to show how much wildlife there is lying all around us if you take the time to stop and look. There is so much to discover right on our doorsteps.